Inkheart by Cornelia Funk Read by Robert Delancey Chapter 6 Fire and Stars The day passed slowly. Maggie saw Mo only in the afternoon, when Eleanor came back from doing her shopping, and a half an hour later gave them spaghetti with some kind of pre-made sauce. I'm afraid I have no patience with toiling over a stove, she said, as she put the dishes on the table. Perhaps our friend with the furry animal can cook? Dustfinger merely shrugged his shoulders apologetically. Sorry. I'm no use to you that way. Mo cooks very well, said Maggie, stirring the thin, watery sauce into her spaghetti. Mo's here to restore my books, not to cook for us, replied Eleanor sharply. What about you, though? Maggie shrugged. I can make pancakes, she said. Why don't you get some cookbooks? You have books of every other kind. I'm sure you'd find cookbooks a help. Eleanor didn't even deign to reply to her suggestion. And by the way, there's a rule for night time, she said, when they had all been eating in silence for a while. I won't have candlelight in my house. Fire makes me nervous. It's far too greedy for paper. Maggie gulped. She felt caught in the act, for of course she had brought candles with her. They were on her bedside table upstairs, where Eleanor must have seen them. However, Eleanor was looking not at Maggie, but at Dustfinger, who was playing with a box of matches. I hope you'll take that rule to heart, she said to him, since you were obviously going to have the pleasure of your company for another night. Yes, if I may impose on your hospitality a little longer, I'll be off first thing in the morning, I promise. Dustfinger was still holding the box of matches. He didn't seem bothered by Eleanor's distrustful gaze. I'd say someone here has the wrong idea about fire, he added. It bites like a fierce little animal, admittedly, but you can tame it. And with these words he took a match out of the box, struck it, and popped the flame into his open mouth. Maggie held her breath as his lips closed around the burning matchstick. Dustfinger opened his mouth again, took out the spent match, smiled, and left it on his empty plate. "'You see, Eleanor,' he said, "'it didn't bite me. "'It's easier to tame than a kitten, "'and almost as easy as a dog.' Eleanor just wrinkled her nose, but Maggie was so amazed that she could hardly take her eyes off Dustfinger's scarred face. She looked at Mo. The little trick with the burning match didn't seem to have surprised him. He shot a warning glance at Dustfinger, who meekly put away the box of matches into his pants pocket. "'But of course so,' Keep the no candles rule, he was quick to say. That's no problem, really. Eleanor nodded. Good, she said. And one more thing. If you go out again as soon as it's dark this evening, the way you did last night, you better not be back too late, because I switch on the burglar alarm at 9.30 on the dot. Ah, then I was in luck yesterday evening. Dustfinger slipped some spaghetti into his bag. Eleanor didn't notice, but Maggie did. Yes, I do enjoy walking at night. The world's more to my liking than not so loud, not so fast, not so crowded, and a good deal more mysterious. But I wasn't planning to walk this evening. I have other plans for tonight, and I'll have to ask you to switch on this wonderful system of yours on a little later than usual. Oh, indeed. And why, may I ask? Dustfinger winked at Maggie. Well, I've promised to put on a little show for this young lady. It begins about an hour before midnight. Oh, yes. Eleanor dabbed some sauce off her lips with her napkin. A little show. Why not in daylight? After all, the young lady's only twelve years old. She should be in bed at eight o'clock. Maggie tightened her lips. She hadn't been to bed as early as eight since her fifth birthday. But she wasn't going to trouble of explaining that to Eleanor. Instead, she admired the casual way Dustfinger reacted to Eleanor's hostile gaze. Ah, but you see, the tricks I want to show Maggie wouldn't look so good by day, he said, leaning back in his chair. I'm afraid I need the black cloak of night. Why don't you come and watch too? Then you'll understand why it all had to be done in the dark. Go on and accept the offer, Eleanor, said Mo. You'll enjoy the show. And then perhaps you won't think fire is so sinister. It's not that I think it's sinister. I just don't like it, that's all, remarked Eleanor, unmoved. He can juggle! Maggie burst out, with eight balls. Eleven, 
Dustfinger corrected her. But juggling's more of a daytime skill. Eleanor retrieved a string of spaghetti from the tablecloth and glanced first at Maggie and then at Mo. She looked cross. Oh, very well. I don't want to be a spoil sport, she said. I will go to bed with a book at 9.30 as usual and put the alarm on first. But when Maggie tells me she's going out for this private performance, I'll switch it off again for an hour. Will that be time enough? Ample time, said Dustfinger, bowing so low to her that the tip of his nose collided with the rim of his plate. Maggie bit back her laughter. It was five to eleven when she knocked at Eleanor's bedroom door. Come in, she heard Eleanor call, and when she put her head around the door, she saw her aunt sitting up in bed, poring over a catalogue as thick as a telephone directory. Oh, too expensive, too expensive, she murmured. Take my advice, Maggie. Never develop a passion you can't afford. It'll eat your heart away like a bookworm. Take this book here, for instance. Eleanor tapped her finger on the left-hand page of her catalogue so hard that it wouldn't have surprised Maggie if she had bored a hole in it. What a fine addition, and in such good condition, too. I've been wanting it for fifteen years, but it just costs too much money. Far too much. Sighing, she closed her catalog, dropped it on the rug, and swung her legs out of bed. To Maggie's surprise, she was wearing a long floral nightdress. She looked younger in it, almost like a girl who has woken up one morning to find her face wrinkled. Ah, well, you'll probably never be as crazy as I am, she muttered, putting on a pair of thick socks on her bare feet. Your father's not inclined to be crazy, and your mother never was either. Quite the opposite. I never knew anyone with a cooler head. My father, on the other hand, was at least as mad as me. I inherited over half my books from him, and what good did they do him? Did they keep him alive? Far from it. He died of a stroke at a book auction. Isn't that ridiculous? With the best will in the world, Maggie didn't know what to say to that. My mother, she asked instead. Did you know her well? Eleanor snorted, as if she had asked a silly question. Of course I did. It was here that your father met her. Didn't he ever tell you? Maggie shook her head. He doesn't talk about her much. Well, probably better not. Why probe old wounds? And you're not particularly like her. She painted that sign on the library door. Come on, then, or you'll miss this show of yours. Maggie followed Eleanor down the unlit corridor. For a moment, she had the odd feeling that her mother might step out of one of the many doors, smiling at her. There was hardly a light on in the whole vast house and once or twice Maggie bumped her knee on a chair or a little table that she hadn't seen in the gloom. "'Why is it so dark everywhere here?' she asked as Eleanor felt around for the light switch in the entrance hall. "'Because I'd rather spend my money on books than unnecessary electricity,' replied Eleanor, looking at the light she had turned on as if she thought the stupid thing should go easy on the power. Then she made her way over to a metal box fixed to the wall near the front door and hidden behind a thick, dusty curtain. I hope you switched your light off before you knocked on my door, she asked as she opened the box. Of course, said Maggie, although it wasn't true. Turn around, Eleanor told her before setting to work on the alarm system. She frowned. Heavens, all these knobs. I hope I haven't done anything wrong again. Tell me as soon as the show's over, and don't even think of seizing your chance to slink into the library and take a book off the shelves. Remember that I sleep right next door, and my hearing is keener than a bat's. Maggie bit back the answer on the tip of her tongue. Eleanor opened the front door. Without a word, Maggie pushed past her and went outside. It was a mild night, full of strange scents and the chirping of crickets. Were you always as nice as this to my mother? She asked as Eleanor was about to close the door behind her. Eleanor looked at her for a moment, as if turned to stone. Oh, yes, I think so, she said. Yes, I'm sure I was. And she was always as cheeky as you, too. Have fun with your fire eater. And then she shut the door. As Maggie was going through the dark garden behind the house, she suddenly heard unexpected music. It filled the night air, as if it had been only waiting for Maggie's footsteps. Strange music, a carnival mixture of bells, pipes, and drums, both boisterous and sad. 
Maggie wouldn't have been surprised to find a whole troop of fair ground entertainers waiting for her on the lawn behind Eleanor's house. But only Dustfinger stood there. He was waiting where Maggie had found him in the afternoon. The music came from a cassette recorder on the grass beside the wooden deck chair. Dustfinger had placed a garden bench on the edge of the lawn for his audience. Lighted torches were stuck into the ground to the right and left of it, and two more were burning on the lawn, casting quivering shadows in the night. The shadows danced across the grass like some servants conjured up by Dustfinger from some dark world for this occasion. He himself stood there, bare-chested, his skin as pale as the moon, which was hanging in the sky right above Eleanor's house, as if it, too, had turned up especially for Dustfinger's show. When Maggie emerged from the darkness, Dustfinger bowed to her. "'Sit down, pretty lady,' he called over the music. "'We were all just waiting for you.' Shyly, Maggie sat down on the bench and looked around her. The two dark glass bottles she had seen in Dustfinger's bag were standing on the deck chair. Something whitish shimmered in the bottle on the left, as if Dustfinger had filled it with moonlight. A dozen torches with white, wadding heads were wedged between the wooden rungs of the chair, and beside the cassette recorder stood a bucket and a large, big-bellied vase, which, if Maggie remembered correctly, came from Eleanor's entrance hall. For a moment, she let her eyes wander to the windows of the house. There was no light in Moe's room. He was probably still working. But one floor below, Maggie saw Eleanor standing at her lighted window. The moment Maggie looked her way, she drew the curtain, as if she had felt Maggie watching her. But she still stayed at the window. Her shadow was a dark outline against the pale yellow curtain. Do you hear how quiet it is? Dustfinger switched off the recorder. The silence of the night fell on Maggie's ears, muffled as if by cotton wool. Not a leaf moved. There was nothing to be heard but the torches crackling and the chirping of the crickets. Dustfinger switched the music back on. I had a private word with the wind, he said. There's one thing you should know. If the wind takes it into his head to play with fire, then even I can't tame the blaze. But it gave me its word of honour to keep still tonight and not spoil our fun. So saying, he picked up one of the torches from Eleanor's deck chair. He sipped from the bottle with the moonlight in it and spat something whitish out into the big vase. Then he dipped the torch he was holding into the bucket, took it out again, and held its dripping head of wadding to one of its burning sisters. The fire flared up so suddenly it made Maggie jump. However, Dustfinger put the second bottle to his lips, filling his mouth until his scarred cheeks were bulging. Then he took a deep, deep breath, arched his body like a bow, and spat whatever was in his mouth out into the air above the burning torch. A fireball hung over Eleanor's lawn, a bright, blazing globe of fire. It ate away at the darkness like a living thing, and it was so big, Maggie felt sure everything around it would go up in flames. The grass, the deck chair, and Dustfinger himself. But he just spun around and around on the spot, exuberant as a dancing child, breathing out more fire. He made the fire climb higher in the air, as if to set the stars alight. Then he lit a second torch and ran its flame over his bare arms. He looked as happy as a child playing with a pet animal. The fire licked at his skin like something alive, a darting, burning creature that he had befriended, a creature that caressed him and danced for him and drove the night away. He threw the torch high in the air where the fireball had just been blazing, caught it as it came down, lit more, juggled with three, four, five torches. The fire whirled around him, danced with him, but never hurt him. Dustfinger, the tamer of flames, the man who breathes sparks, the friend of fire. He made the torches disappear as if the darkness had devoured them, bowed to the speechless Maggie with a smile, before once again spitting fire out into the knight's black face. Afterward, 
She could never say what had distracted her attention from the whirling torches and the shower of sparks, making her look up once more at the house and its windows. Perhaps you feel the presence of evil on your skin like sudden heat or cold. Or perhaps it was just that the light now seeping through the library shutters caught her eye, the light falling on the rhododendron bushes where their leaves press close to the wood. Perhaps. She thought she heard voices rising above Dustfinger's music, men's voices, and a terrible fear rose inside her, as dark and strange as the terror she felt on the night when she first saw Dustfinger standing out in the yard. As she jumped up, a burning torch slipped from his hands and fell on the grass. He quickly trod out the fire before it could spread any further, then followed the direction of Maggie's eyes, and he, too, looked at the house without a word. Maggie began to run. Gravel crunched under her feet as she raced towards the house. The front door stood ajar. There was no light in the entrance hall, but Maggie heard loud voices echoing down the corridor that led to the library. Mo, she called. And there was that fear back again, digging its curved beak into her heart, taking her breath away. The library door was open, too. Maggie was about to rush in when two strong hands grasped her by the shoulders. Quiet, breathed Eleanor, pulling her into the bedroom. Maggie saw her fingers were shaking as she locked the door. Don't! Maggie dragged Eleanor's hand away and tried to turn the key. She wanted to shout that she must help her father, but Eleanor put a hand over her mouth and pulled her away from the door. Hard as Maggie struggled, hitting and kicking, Eleanor was strong, much stronger than Maggie. There are too many of them, Eleanor whispered as Maggie tried to bite her fingers. About four or five big strong men, and they're armed. She hauled the struggling Maggie over to the wall by the bed, told myself a hundred times, oh, a thousand times, I ought to buy a revolver, she muttered, pressing her ear to the wall. Of course it's here, the voice called through the wall, without Maggie having to strain to hear it, rasping like a cat's tongue. Should we get your little daughter from the garden to show us just where? Or would you rather find it for us yourself? Maggie tried to pull Eleanor's hand away from her mouth. Stop it, for goodness sake, Eleanor hissed in her hair. You'll only put him in more danger, do you understand? My daughter. What do you know about my daughter? That was Moe's voice. Maggie sobbed aloud, and Eleanor's fingers were instantly back over her face. I tried to call the police, she whispered in Maggie's ear, but the lines are all down. Oh, we know all we need to know, the other voice again. So where's the book? I'll give it to you. Moe's voice sounded weary, but I'm going with you, because I want that book back as soon as Capricorn has finished with it. Going with them? What did he mean? He couldn't leave just like that. Maggie tried making for the door again, but Eleanor held her fast. Maggie did her best to push her away, but Eleanor simply wrapped her strong arms around her and pressed her fingers to Maggie's lips once more. All the better. We were told to bring you anyway, said a second voice. It had a broad, coarse accent. You have no idea how long Capricorn longs to hear your voice. He's got great faith in your abilities, Capricorn has. That's right. The replacement Capricorn found for you makes a terrible hash of it. The rasping voice again. Look at Cockerel here. Maggie heard feet scraping on the floor. He's limping, and Flatnose's face has seen better days. Not that he's ever much of a beauty. Don't just stand there, Bastard. We haven't got all forever. How about it? Do we take the kid as well? Another voice. That one sounded as if the speaker's nose were being pinched. No, Mo snapped at him. My daughter stays here, or I won't give you the book. One of the men laughed. Oh yes, Silver Tongue. You'd give it to us, all right, but don't worry. We weren't told to bring her. A child would just slow us down. And Capricorn's been waiting for you long enough already. So where's the book? Maggie pressed her ear against the wall so hard that it hurt. She heard footsteps, and then a sound like something being pushed aside. Eleanor, beside her, held her breath. 
Not a bad hiding place, said the cat-like voice. Wrap it up, Cockerel, and take good care of it. After you, Silver Tongue. Let's go. They left the library. Maggie tried desperately to wiggle out of Eleanor's arms. She heard the sound of the library door closing and then steps moving away, getting fainter and fainter. After that, all was still. Quite suddenly, Eleanor let go of her. Maggie rushed to the door, unlocked it, sobbing, and ran down the corridor to the library. It was deserted. No mo. The books stood ranged tidily on their shelves, except in one place where there was a wide, dark gap. Maggie thought she saw a hinged flap, well hidden, standing among the other books. Incredible, she heard Eleanor saying behind her. They really were after just that one book. But Maggie pushed Purr aside and ran along the corridor. Maggie! Eleanor called after her. Wait! But what was there to wait for? For the strangers to take her father away? She heard Eleanor running after her. Eleanor's arms might be stronger, but Maggie's legs were faster. There was no light in the entrance hall. The front door stood wide open, and a cold wind blew on Maggie's face as she stumbled breathlessly out into the night. Mo! she shouted. She thought she saw car headlights come on where the drive disappeared into the trees, and an engine started. Maggie ran that way. She tripped and fell, grazing her knee on the gravel, which was wet with dew. Warm blood trickled down her leg, but she took no notice. She ran on and on, limping and sobbing until she reached the big wrought iron gate. The road beyond it was empty. Mo was gone.